Hello, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Adam Downing with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And today we're going to be talking about life of a clear cut. We're going to end up in a clear cut, but for now we're going to start in a more mature forest setting. And we're going to talk about the life of a clear cut in two pronged approach. The vegetative life and also the wildlife. And especially for that wildlife component, I have a very special guest with us today with the Department of Wildlife Resources, previously known as Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Now they are DWR, Department of Wildlife Resources. And that is David Kochka, who's a wildlife biologist with DWR. Today we're in Albemarle County. It's a nice, relatively cool morning um, in August. And we're in a kind of a mixed hardwood stand right here. Um, an older age stand. Behind me you got a very large white oak tree and there's several of those kind of around in this stand. The main thing in a stand like this is because you have predominantly older age trees here you'll notice there's very little understory. You know there's nothing down here at, at my level and, and so if you were an animal such as a deer this this time of year there's not that much here for you to eat you're kind of waiting on the acorns. When they start dropping, um, that's what they'll be eating in a stand like this. So it provides food for a variety of wildlife, but maybe only seasonal food. Um, it doesn't provide for those foods when those acorns aren't available. There's, like I said, there's not much vegetation here because there's not much sunlight. As you can see, we're standing in the shade. The shade is provided by all these overstory trees that are here. This is a very mature white oak and like any tree that, that grows in the forest it's not going to be here forever. Eventually they they will die of senescence. Senescence. They basically die of getting old and they start to get open um, and susceptible, more susceptible to diseases and parasites. So eventually a big tree like this is going to come down um, on its own, if nothing else. But as it, as it provides a variety of uses for wildlife, and initially it's providing, once it gets to a certain age, it's providing those acorns, the production that we talked about. But as it gets older and limbs start to die out and, and parts of it start to decay or whatever, then it does open up that it's more usable for other species of wildlife that aren't just eating the acorns. And that would be some of the the woodpecker species and things like that, and squirrels that will find an opening where they can make a, you know, a, a, a cavity in there, um, and the same with some birds, but also those insects that are growing in or under, just under the, the bark where those species can get to it. So it provide, ver, provides a variety of, of food over the years for wildlife, sometimes very, um, plentiful and other times not as plentiful. And white oaks, as the acorn goes, this is the number one acorn in terms of desirability. All wildlife likes white oak acorns. They're a very, they're a sweet acorn. They have less tannic acid than other species of oaks. The, the black oak group, which contains a variety of, of oaks in it, are more consistent producers, but they're less desirable. But wildlife will still make use of them. Okay, so we're in a, uh, another spot on this property here in Albemarle County, and um, this is a site that is dominated by American Red Cedar, which is not a cedar, incidentally, it's a juniper tree, and it's fairly slow growing, it's a native tree, and so from that standpoint, it's not bad. Uh, this is a neighboring where the clear cut uh, occurred a few years ago that we're gonna show you next. But where the clear cut was is what this looked like before the clear cut. And so I ask David now to just kind of comment on this again from a wildlife perspective. So it's a kind of a darker shade, uh, the, the understory, what kinds of plants we see here besides the cedar that I already referenced, what do we have going on? Um, this kind of shows a couple of good and bad things, I guess. Uh, first of all, there's a little bit, there has been a little bit more light at times reaching the, the forest floor here versus where we were initially. And so because of that, you see a little bit more ground cover, things down at this level that some species would either eat 
or make use of as potential cover. And there's more kind of tree limbs and things like that that provide some cover for a variety of species, everything down to um, you know insects and um, uh, reptiles and amphibians, things like that. Um, the the negatives would be that yeah you've got it's dominated by cedars, which they do produce a berry that can be eaten by wildlife, but they really have no other real benefit to wildlife. They're slow growing and eventually they kind of close in. I mean, I've been in areas and I'm sure you have too, Adam, where it's just a big stand of cedars and you've got to get down on your hands and knees to get through it. So there's no light penetrating at that point. The ground under that is typically open, but it's just completely shaded in and there's nothing growing in there. And so really almost like a desert for wildlife at times. So there is some, some benefits of some ground cover here and a little bit more than it was pre-existing in the other place, um, but it's not that great overall in terms of wildlife. Um, you know, we're kind of going through a progression where, um, you know, especially in the, the older stand, more mature stand, there wasn't that much cover down this level for um, a lot of bird species. There's a lot of bird species that, that we have concerns about, and those species would be devoid in that area. They would find no safety. A lot of birds, especially ground-dwelling birds, nesting birds, they need a lot of stems up above them to protect them from other, especially avian predators and some brown predators. So so that's one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at, at different these different stands. You know, what kind of cover is there for wildlife overall? Um, so it's that in the, the kind of marginal foods that are here that don't make it super great for wildlife. And that, there's a lot of non-native species that are existing here down in the understory. Um, one of the biggest things that's a factor throughout Virginia these days is Japanese stilt grass. Um, it's highly invasive, um, uh, obviously not native to here. It likes, especially some of these disturbed and even undisturbed areas, they just basically, it, it just moves in and, and creates a ground cover that's not really benefit to anything and it is so aggressive that it really uh, outcompetes other native species that might be existing there. Um, in here you've also got some uh, autumn olives that are coming in in various places and again that, these things actually produce a tremendous crop of berries when they mature for wildlife they're very consistent but again it's a non-native thing um, and they, they, so they outcompete, and they're just hard once they get become established to get rid of them. You really have to work hard with use like herbicides and some other things to, to get rid of these things because they, they can take over a whole field. Oriental bittersweet that's growing in here. Um, again, a non-native species that, that takes off um, and impacts the, the tree species that it grows on over time too. And again, these are all just non-natives that have come in here and and so as a landowner, typically people want to try to, to treat, manage those things to minimize their impacts on their land uh, because they can become the, what, what you have as a, almost a dominant species on the landscape. We're actually in the clear cut now. We've been working our way in reverse succession from the older hardwood forest into kind of a medium aged uh, uh, cedar and poplar stand and now into a clear cut, an early successional stage. Managing successional stages is what we do to get the vegetation, the structure and the mix of vegetation uh, that benefits certain types of, of wildlife habitat. So this particular clear, clear cut that we're standing in now uh, was conducted uh, four years ago. It was left fallow for a year. It was planted with shortleaf pine which is the native southern yellow pine for the Piedmont of Virginia. And that was planted um, two years ago. This is the second full growing season that uh, we're closing in on now. And so there is a shortleaf pine uh, next to me here that was planted. It's hard to find these right now with all, all the other vegetation so tall, but the shortleaf pine is here. This particular one is knee high and is, uh, and is looking pretty good. So yes, Adam, here's your your one of your seedlings that were planted two years ago, the shortleaf pine. And it's not, this, this tree is not doing a whole lot right now in terms of providing, let's say, wildlife benefit or anything else at this point. It's just trying to grow and get established. Um, 
but what we're seeing in throughout this clear cut is just the tremendous diversity in terms of species that are here and again some of them are there are some non-native invasives that have come in here but they can be handled on kind of a, almost like a case-by-case -case basis here so look around at the the vast amount of uh, productivity that's being experienced here versus those two experiences we were in earlier the the older age stand and then the mid-range stand so there's a, a just a tremendous a cover here that's being provided to wildlife so if you're you know, the, the example I might use would be Bob White Crail, native species, you know, it's a small bird. And if you're one of those, you want to be able to have, be down here and, and have protection from avian predators and even those, those mammal predators that are on the landscape, you know, foxes, coyotes, whatever. Um, this provides them that kind of cover to be able to, to elude those, those predators a lot more than if they were in this mid-age stand or that old age stand. They just wouldn't go there because it, they would not feel safe at all. Um, we pointed out earlier, we saw a, a, you know, a bee that was in here feeding in some of these flowers. He's still here. Um, everybody's interested in pollinators these days. You know, this would provide a, a really great landscape at this point in time for those pollinators. There's, there's things out here that they can be feeding on um, as species. So there's a lot of benefits. There are some drawbacks. Yes, people would initially look at this and they have that word, that framework in their mind of clear cut. Oh my gosh, it looks like a moonscape. And when you first cut it, yeah, it looks barren. But like you said, those, those trees were planted here. But in addition to that, all this other stuff here has come in on its own. It's not like they were out here broadcasting seed. These are all, a lot of it, native species that grow in and it's just like kind of like a garden over time. They change over time in terms of the, the components that are here. This is not going to stay like this. Okay, that's what I think part of the image problem with clear cuts is people think that that moonscape is what's going to be the future of that whole, whole whatever acreage this is over time. That's what it's going to look like. No, it's going to look like these other forests over time because other things are going to eventually shade out some of these species. That's why you keep as a land manager, you tr keep trying to provide various stages of succession on your property to the benefit of wildlife and as a benefit, these, these eventually these trees can be harvested for timber. So all those things play into these decisions that are made about clear cutting or not clear cutting. Now, you know, this tree was way too old, but if there had been a little bit younger tree on the landscape here, this hardwood, basically when you clear cut like in a situation like this you could be seeing typically some stump sprouting from those species and basically again that's what your future forest would grow from you're always working for the future forest and what those benefits might be to, to wildlife in addition to just the the forest that's out there and uh, i hope that you've enjoyed some of the sounds that you're hearing in this clear cut there's a lot of insect activity and as david mentioned the pollinators and the other insects and these really are the building blocks for the bigger macro fauna wildlife that we enjoy seeing, whether that's birds or deer or, or a fox. As per my custom, I'll uh, zoom in here a little bit to the hat. Today I'm wearing actually my own organization's hat, Virginia Cooperative Extension. And if you look at it closely, you'll see a couple colors, and these represent the two universities in Virginia that are land-grant universities, Virginia Tech in Blacksburg and Virginia State University in Petersburg. And this is a partnership undertaking in terms of what Virginia Cooperative Extension is. And the word cooperative not only implies that partnership, but many more. The local level, county government, uh, state government, and in my case, on a day-to-day -day basis, and working with people like David Kochka and Department of Wildlife Resources. So thank you once again. Please tune in next week to hear Jason Fisher and his 15 minutes in the forest. And don't forget to subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you next time.